And the next talk is about um, full state keyed duplex with built-in multi-user support by John Damon, Bart Menning, and Gilles Van Asche. And Bart will give the talk, please. Okay, thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, the sponge function is a popular design of, of a hash function. Um, it's introduced by, by uh, Bartoni et al. in 2006-2007. And it has now been used for, for SHA-3, for example output functions, and for many lightweight hash functions. And it is, it is particularly popular due to its well, con conceptual design. So where you use, in, uh, originally, where in original hash functions you use a block cipher in a certain mode of operation. This time you just use a single permutation. So what? Um, one permutation over a large state, and the state is then split into an inner part <coughs> of C bits and an outer part of R bits. And the idea of this point is that the message is absorbed into the outer part. So the message is padded and then absorbed in the outer part, interlaced with evaluations of the permutation. And then the output also is squeezed from the outer part. Um, the inner part is left untouched. So you have a C bit state that is left untouched, and this C bit uh, state ensures the security of the design. And Bartoni et al. proved that if this permutation is assumed to be ideal, that the sponge function behaves like a random oracle up to 2 to the C over 2. So if an attacker cannot make much more than 2 to the C over 2, uh, can make uh, no 2 to the C over 2 evaluations, it achieves security. Um, this is just hashing, but in many applications we need a key function, a MAC function, or, or encryption. And you can use a hash function for MACing. You can use HMAC, but in many cases HMAC is reasonably inefficient because if you have a short message, you have to evaluate the hash function twice. And for the SHA-3, the, beauti the, the beautiful aspect of SHA-3 is that you, of the sponges that you do not need HMAC, instead you can just concatenate the key in the message and you have a PRF. So this is what we call the, the key point. So it gets in with the key and the message. It concatenates the key and the message, and you have a PRF. And that's the key point. You can use it for message authentication. The PRF applies message authentication. Um, you can also use it for a key stream generation. So if instead of the message, you, you take a nonce, um, and you have an output of a variable length, you can use this output um, as a key stream and encrypt your data with it. Um, this is the key point, but in many applications you don't just need authentication or encryption, you want to have it both. In this setting, ideally, you don't use the key point, but it, it's a sibling, and its sibling is the key to duplex. So the key duplex is used for authenticated <laughs> encryption. There are many Caesar submissions that follow the duplex design. And I will go in a bit more detail on these two designs, on the history of these two designs, uh, starting with the key point. So here we see the key point. Um, it has the key concatenated with the message. So this is exactly the key sponge um, where the key concatenated with the message. It was introduced by Bertoni et al. in 2011. And in 2015, we analyzed it, we formalized it, and called it the outer key sponge. Um, why outer key? Because the key goes in the outer part. And because there is also an inner key sponge. And in the inner key sponge, the key goes into the inner part. And this is the way you initialize the secret state. Um, this scheme appeared before in uh, Chang et al. 2012. We formalized it in 2015. And Naito and Yasuda analyzed these two schemes and um, derived improved bounds. However, at some point we noticed that you can improve the scheme. You have the C-bit capacity that ensures some secrecy. Um, and the extraction should also leave this part untouched. Because if the attacker learns the entire state scheme is broken. But for absorption, you have a key, and the state is secret. And there is no point in keeping this part untouched for absorption. In more detail, we uh, have the full state keyed sponge, in which case the message is, uh, is absorbed in the entire state. Um, this appeared, the first appearance of this is the monkey duplex by the, the sponge people, by Bertoni et al., um, though without any formalization. It was just a mentioning of the scheme. Uh, Ghazi et al. analyzed this in case you just have one block, so without the other ones, that significantly sig uh, simplifies the analysis. And in 2015, uh, me together with Reza uh, Reynitebach and Damian Vizar, introduced, formalized, and analyzed the scheme. 
And the interesting aspect is that all of these three schemes achieve an approximately the same level of security, even though this one is more efficient. And that's the, the beauty of the full uh, duplex, the full sponge. Now for the duplex, this is the unkeyed duplex. It's a bit uh, different. So you have an initialization state with an inner part and an outer part, again. You can think of the duplex as a, a sequential evaluation of some small sponges. So a sponge where you absorb some data, transform the state, and extract some uh, digits. So absorb, transform, extract. Absorb, transform, extract. And that, those are duplexing calls. Uh, this is the plain duplex from Bertoni et al. Yeah, in 2011. You can key it again by concatenating the key with uh, the first block. In this case, you um, make the state secret, and then you can do the duplex sequentially. You can do, use this for encryption, right? So the met here you can input a message. You can output the, the key string, the, the ciphertext of the message. So you can use this for encryption. You can also just input nothing and take the output as a tag. And this way, you can get authenticated encryption. Um, but again, there is no point of keeping the inner part untouched. So now in 2015, again, we introduced uh, the full state key duplex. And it has full state absorption. So the message goes into the entire state. The digits is extracted from the outer part. So you uh, extract Z0 or Z1 or Z2 bits where the ZI is at most R. So you still leave the inner part untouched for extraction, but you absorb over the entire state. And again, the, the schemes are equally, are equally secure, even though this one's more efficient. Um, now, looking more detail into uh, this scheme, what we proved two years ago was roughly this bound. So it's a very simplified form of the bound. So we proved that the scheme is secure as long as um, this term is less than 1. So this is mu times n over 2 to the k plus m squared over 2 to the c. And k is the key size. c is the inner part, the size of the inner part, the capacity. The key is always smaller than the inner part. <coughs> so k is smaller than c. Um, and M is the data complexity, the online complexity, which corresponds to the number of queries the bad guy makes to the scheme. Uh, N is the number of calls the attacker can make to the randomized primitive, the permutation. And mu is some, some magical term, it's called the multiplicity. Um, intuitively, the multiplicity counts the, uh, considers the maximum multi-collision on the outer part of the state. So if you look fo focus on the outer part of the state, mu tries to find the, the maximum uh, multi-collision on that state. Intuitively, mu is at most 2m. Um, at that point, we, th we, we thought we were done. I mean, this is the most efficient way of doing the duplex. The bar looks clean and, and nice and very secure. However, a second thought reveals that it could be improved a bit. So first of all, we see mu times n over 2 to the k. So what is mu? Um, we don't know, but it is at most 2m. So the first term is of the order m times n over 2 to the k. So that's birthday bound security only in the key size. And that's quite counterintuitive because if you look at the scheme, the key only appears in the first block. And you cannot use the full data complexity, so the entire online complexity to break the scheme to recover the key. So birthday bound security in the key size is somewhat counterintuitive here. There are also some other minor limitations in the scheme. Um, so first of all, you yeah, had a dominating term mu n over 2 to the k, but instead you would expect something like mu times n over 2 to the c. Because this one corresponds to a collision between a construction call and a primitive call on the inner part of the state. The multiplicity mu is only known a posteriori. It's a, it's a parameter that depends on the randomness of the primitive, the randomness of the scheme, and on the randomness or the, the, the coins or the choices of the adversary. And in fact, it should be computed. It should not stay in the bound. And this is a weird thing, this multiplicity. It's kind of an artifact from an earlier as, um, paper from the Bartoni et al. sequence. Um, the scheme does not allow for, it's not analyzed in a multi-user uh, setting. And as you've seen in the previous uh, talk, it's a very interesting and popular and also practical uh, topic, practical setting to analyze the scheme. So it, it should be analyzed in a multi-user setting. And finally, it only has a very limited um, measurement in the 
uh, adversarial strength. So we just have data complexity and time complexity. But if you use a scheme for encryption, we have, for instance, an encryption scheme where the nonce can be reused, or an encryption scheme where the nonce cannot be reused. Those are two different cases, and they're not covered by the bound. So it's not clear how the scheme behaves in these settings. And inspired by this, we, we generalized the scheme, and we came up with this new duplex. So for some reason, we still call it the full state key duplex. Um, <coughs> so there are some conceptual differences. The first one is that it has multi-user security by design. So it gets its input instead of a single key, it gets its input a key sequence, um, a key array, boldface uh, k. And the input, there is an index delta which specifies which key in the array to take. And this sounds like a very small difference because it usually in security bounds, there are security models. You have to um, <laughs> stretch the model to multi-user security. Now you can just use the single model, analyze this scheme, and you have multi-user security because you use a key array. And in fact, in the bound, in the final bound, it becomes visible how uh, relations among the keys influence the security. So we use, for instance, the min entropy in this key array, and it, this term appears in the bound. So this kind of simplifies the analysis. You do not need to adapt the security model to every different type of uh, key array. The initial state is concatenation of uh, the key, that, that key uh, with some IV, which may or may not be a nonce. Um, we have, well, this is a small uh, improvement. We have full state absorption. So the sigma goes over the entire state. We don't need to pad it anymore. So that, uh, well, saves one bit. Um, well, one bit is almost no bit, but it still simplifies the scheme a bit. Um, we did a rephasing, so this is a, a, a kind of a weird, it's, it's not really an improvement, but it's to suit the analysis. So in the original duplex we had um, absorption, transformation, extraction, absorption, transformation, extraction. So absorption of sigma, transformation, extraction of Z. Now we look at the scheme as transformation, extraction, absorption. And the reason to do this is that we look at different um, duplexing calls. So we have, uh, this is the initialization call, including the F <laughs> absorption, uh, extraction and absorption. This is a duplexing call, and wait, wait, wait. this is a duplexing call, and this is a different duplexing call. And there is a difference, namely that the outer part is overwritten or is not overwritten. And to suit the analysis, so the reason why we use these two is to cover, for instance, the case of release of unverified plain text. If you use an authenticated encryption scheme, uh, for which the decryption, the verification, outputs the message before the tag is actually verified, you have a release of unverified plain text, and this one covers the setting. So it allows us to analyze a more um, refined adversarial strength. <laughs> and now it drives the following security bound. It looks a little bit more complex because we cover many more uh, adversaries. So we have uh, QIV times N over 2 to the K. So let me first go for the, uh, consider this fraction and then the second one. So now we have QIV times n over 2 to the k, where QIV is the maximum number of initialization queries for the same IV. Recall that in the old bound we had mu times n over 2 to the k, where mu is at most m. In this case, you have QIV times n over 2 to the k, where QIV is the maximum number of initialization queries with the same IV. Uh, which is upper bounded by the number of keys in the key array. Because every IV can be used at most, um, in the, in the, well, the U times if there are U different keys. We do not count duplicate queries here. So if you make the same query for the same IV and the same delta, it only counts once. So in this case, QIV is at most U, and if you use a single key setting, QIV is at most 1. And you get N over 2 to the K rather than mu times N over 2. Now for the second term, in the old bound was m times n over 2 to the c. Now we get l plus omega plus new rcm m times n. Where l is the number of queries with a repeated path. And with a repeated path, we mean that if you make two queries with the same sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 4, and then a different sigma 5, then you have two queries with the same path, and then it goes into a different direction. 
and out counts the number of queries with a repeated path, so for which a path already appeared. Omega is the number of queries with an overriding outer part, so the number of duplexing calls of this shape, and which corresponds to the release of unverified paint text. And new RCM is some multi-collision coefficient. So instead of uh, mu, which was based on the adversarial strength, this is just a thing uh, based on RC and M. And it's important to note that new RCM is often a very small constant. And in many cases, L and omega are dominating here. Um, so a little bit more on this new RCM. It's essentially a balls and bins problem. So we have M balls thrown into 2 to the R bins. And new RCM is it's a bit of a technical definition. It's the smallest value x, such that the probability that the fullest bin is at least x is at most x over 2 to the c. <coughs> so it's a, it's a rather complex, uh, a complex definition, but let me explain it in a bit more detail. Suppose you take a very high level of x. So suppose we take x to be very high. In this case, the probability will be very low. Because if x is very high, the probability that there is a bin which is full of, um, which has more balls than x is very low. So if x is very high, this term will be very low, and x over 2 to the c will be very high. So there is a huge gap between the probability and this term on the right hand side. On the other hand, if x gets very small, <coughs> the probability gets very high, and this one gets very low. So at some point, you um, don't have less or equal, but the first term is bigger than the second. <coughs> and new searches for the value x for which you still have this equation, or at least an upper bound on this value x, because if x increases, this one decreases. Um, we did some analysis, so first of all, we simplified this um, probability a little bit, and then we um, also derived a proper and easy to use upper bound on this new RCM. Um, and so we also made a, uh, some computations. So first of all, we simplified uh, this probability a bit, and we did some computation for the case of R plus C is 256. It doesn't really matter what R and C are, because the picture shifts with R, if you see in the bottom line. So here we have 2 to the R. The black line are some computations of this uh, probability. Um, and uh, we have four, two lemmas, lemma 4 and lemma 5, it doesn't matter uh, that they're called lemma 4 and lemma 5. Uh, that upper bound it is the value x, and these values, these uh, lemmas, can be used in the final uh, bound. Um, so I have some very nice slides on the proof <coughs> idea, but I will skip them, because I would rather like to go to the um, applications. Um, so one of the applications is on the full state Keats sponge because there is some um, relation between the duplex and the sponge. You can exchange the bounds. So if you have a bound for the sponge, you can use it for the duplex and the other way around. Um, you can use our bound now for the sponge. Um, so here we have the sponge. Indeed, if you have a duplex call, so if you look at uh, this call, and you either do not absorb any data or you do not extract any data, in this case, you get a sponge. So in this case, the first duplexing call doesn't extract any data. Second one doesn't extract data. Doesn't extract data, doesn't extract data. This one doesn't absorb data. And in this case, you can design a sponge from the duplex. And <coughs> this is a general case where we have multi, uh, well, we have a key array, so multi-key security. Um, overrides are possible. So we look at a general um, case, we do not have a nonce restriction, we do not have a nonce, so also not a nonce restriction. In this case, this means that L and omega can be arbitrary, arbitrarily large, at most about M. The new term, which is often constant, disappears, is negligible at the bound. QIV is the number of users, the number of keys is the most used, so you get U times N over 2 to the K plus M N over 2 to the C, which improves the bound of uh, two years ago. Um, now for authenticated encryption, we can look at uh, two different uh, cases. So first of all, it's a nonce violated case, where we de facto do not have a nonce. Um, also, we consider arbitrary um, number of overrides. So L and omega are at most M, so as, as arbitrary as possible. The new term is 
negligible. So we get a bound of a similar form. So I didn't replace QIV by U, but we get a similar bound. Now for the not respecting setting, in the not respecting setting and no release of unverified plain text, not respecting means that you never have a repeated path. So every time you use a different nonce, so all path, paths are fresh. So L is zero, <laughs> omega is also zero. And in this case, in the second part of the bound, the dominating term is new. And recall that new is <coughs> often close to a constant. And if we have single keys, if we consider the single keys, I think QIV is one, so you get n over two to the k plus constant times n over two to the c, which is a very strong bound. Um, and to show the strength of these bounds, uh, we looked at the Caesar competition. The current uh, third round has four sponge-based uh, schemes, which are Ketcha, Ascon, Norx, and Giac. Um, they all have different parameters, of course. The most important column is the C, which is the capacity, which, is the, the, which guarantees the security. Um, and of course, in the, bout, I've, in the bouts I've shown you, I left out some, some details. Um, but you can believe me that if we do some, some reasonable upper bound on the online complexity, so we say we refresh the key as long as the, as, as soon as the message reach, reaches some certain level. So you can do this, you can refresh the, the, the entire key as long as, you, as soon as the, the data complexity reached a certain threshold. Um, this means that we can consider a case where the online complexity is at most uh, 2 to the A, and we get a bound. And security, as long as the offline complexity is at most uh, this term in the nonce violating setting, which in practical <coughs> cases is close to 2 to the C over 2. So for instance, for Kiak, you have uh, C is 256. And the nonce violating setting approaches, well, 128, often a bit higher. But in the nonce respecting setting, you get actually 255 bits of security. Um, and this perfectly matches this view here, that nu is a close to a constant. This one, if, if, if you take a C bit key, then you get n over 2 to the C plus n over 2 to the C. So this um, C bits of security. And that's also reflected in the computation of the bounds. So let me conclude, uh, the, the new full state key duplex um, is a first style primitive. It's a more general primitive that covers many more uh, settings. It covers multi-user security by design. It also covers more potential adversaries. It covers adversaries in the non-suspecting setting, the non-misuse setting, the rub setting, not the rub setting, etc. Um, it makes life easier for the sponge mode designer. Uh, I copied this from a slide from you, uh, so uh, he didn't mind that, I hope. Um, the scheme has already been used, so the FSKD, the full state key duplex, is used in GIA. It could also be used for the other schemes to improve the, the efficiency and security. And I also think this multi-collision analysis is new, could be of, of further interest. Uh, that concludes my talk, so I would like to thank you for your attention. about the, um, there was the two variants where it's kind of interrupted and non-interrupted, I don't know what yes. the words were for it. Um, does, it do you, does this mean that basically your analysis holds no matter whether we do interrupt, non-interrupt, or mixed, or anything? Or yes, the attacker can choose. How yeah. it. Like on each query we can choose which one we use. Yes, so. each query, so um, if you look at the, yeah, well, in this picture we had the, uh, a duplexing call. So the attacker can say I initialize the state or I duplex the state and in this case it gives a sigma. In our setting it can choose I initialize the state, I duplex the state with override or I duplex the state without override. Mm -hmm. And so the attacker can choose what it, what it wants. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker. <laughs>